hour has come, and you have a choice. Open the doors of your mind, or be stuck forever, somewhere in dreamland. It looked like the reflection of a dead person in the casket. And the memories of waking up in the night. Uh, knowing I'm not alone in the room. We have three cities that all claim to be the UFO capital of the entire world. So when she turned on the kids' light, it stopped walking. My parents told me these things didn't exist. They're a little more ominous, creepy, scary, and the question is, there, what, what is this thing? Hovering just inches from the window was literally, is what you'd imagine a grave to be. Never seen anything like this in my life. I'm still left with more questions than answers. Welcome back, dreamers. If you've had an encounter, please contact me at somedreamland at gmail.com or find me on Facebook at Somewhere in Dreamland Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please help it grow by subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing this episode with friends, family, and social media. Tonight, my guest is Steve Stockton. Steve is the author of three books with several more on the way. Strange Things in the Woods, My Strange World, and National Park Mysteries and Disappearances. Steve is also the host of a couple of YouTube channels that are really great. 13 Past Midnight and Missing Persons and Mysteries. So without further ado, grab your blanket, turn down the lights, get comfy, and let's fade away into... Dreamland! <laughs> Hey, Steve, glad to have you on. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk with you. It's going to be a pretty easy uh, interview. I'm pretty laid back, so I just want to pick your brain. All right. Sounds good. I'm laid back, too. So Good deal, man. Good deal. So I want to talk about your, your books. You've got, what, three books out? Is that correct? Uh, Yeah, three and, and part of another one. I co-wrote one with uh, another author. All right. Um, Well, I have read... Strange Things in the Woods, excellent. Mm-hmm. Uh, My Strange World, loved it. I haven't got to the to the National Park Mysteries yet, uh, but I do want to get to that. So, um, so let's let's talk about how how did you get into this? Like, what what really piqued your interest uh, in, in the paranormal and the weird and the bizarre? Well, a lot of it was just due to my raising, uh, my family on my mother's side uh, particularly my grandmother her mother they were into the spiritualism movement from around the turn of the last century and uh, so I was always around stuff that you know it, it didn't seem weird to me then but it does now looking back not knowing that that wasn't everybody's experience but my, my granny uh, she told fortunes um, she called herself a gypsy witch but she's really in Appalachia what's known as a granny witch or in some circles she'd even be a kitchen witch but uh, she told fortunes she read tea leaves and coffee grounds and made charms um, she also did uh, phrenology where you tell things about you by the bumps on your head and uh, red palms a little bit of everything like that and a lot of it came from her because she knew every legend every superstition every ghost story in the area there where she was from and where we lived and uh just came by it that way um saw my first ghost when i was about five or six years old between five and six and it didn't scare me it just kind of you know piqued my interest like you know, hmm, what was that and it just from there just kind of bloomed you know and uh, sent me on a, a lifelong journey initially looking for answers but the, the longer i've delved into it for well over 50 years now total it's uh i found that there's more questions than there are answers but that's the, the fun is in finding the new questions i think and 
it wouldn't be half, half as enjoyable if there were answers to some of these mysteries. I completely agree with that. It, that that's what makes it fun and exciting. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that, that is a, a very good statement. So the first time you saw a ghost, uh, that that's a story in, in My Strange World, the first, first story, right? Yeah. Yeah, could you share that w- with the audience real quick? Yeah, I was um, out in the yard just messing around waiting for the, the neighbor kid to get home. And we lived out in the country on 26 acres, so our nearest neighbor was about two miles away. But um, there in front of our house, our house was set back uh, from the road exactly 212 feet. I measured the driveway later on for another reason. I was about halfway in the yard waiting for my friend to come home. I was watching the, the road came down there was an inverted T intersection right in front of where our house was and uh, I saw a car coming down the hill and I thought okay is that him I started walking toward the road and uh, when the car stops at the stop sign um, I see a kid run out from behind the car didn't seem to get out of the car and I thought oh, okay that's my friend but then I realized no that's not my friend at all that's a very small child like a toddler and uh my first thought was, you know, the person in the car doesn't see the kid. I'm, he's going to get run over. But uh, the, the kid ran across the road in front of the car, down into our yard. Uh, the person driving the car didn't register anything. He looked left, looked right, and then turned to the right and went toward the lake. And uh, the kid, he ran across the road at an angle, down into our yard, I'm guessing maybe 10, 12 feet. And if you've ever noticed little kids who... I've just barely mastered walking. Sometimes they'll start running and then just kind of lose control and fall down. Yeah. Well, that's what this little boy did. But when he fell, he just vanished. He disappeared. And I, I didn't take my eyes off the spot. I went directly to it. I was probably within 60 to 75 feet of it at that time because I'd already started walking toward the road before I realized it wasn't my friend. And there was nothing there, nothing that I could have misidentified as a kid no hole that a kid could have fallen into absolutely nothing i could still see the way he was dressed head on uh, for that period in modern clothing uh little shorts and uh, with suspenders and a matching blue cap white shirt white socks and shoes and uh probably about two years old i'm guessing but I have no idea what that was all about. And I asked my grandmother about it later on because, again, she was an expert in all things like that. And she just said, well, that's whatever's out there way of telling you that sometimes you'll see things that other people don't. And just kind of cryptically left it at that. Do you think but, that's, uh, that's true? Do you think that other people are more adept, adept to seeing things than, than others are feeling? I, or? I think it's something that we probably all possess to a degree. But some people are more in tune to it, and I think it's other, you know, there's other things involved there, like playing guitar, for example. Anybody can learn to do it, but it comes easier for some people to learn to do it. Right. You just you seem to have a natural affinity for it. And that's kind of the way I believe things like that with the paranormal. And now, again, this is according to my grandmother, who was present at my birth. I was born with a veil over my face or a call. All it is is the afterbirth was stuck to my face and uh, they have to take it off. But in superstitious lore, particularly in Appalachia, that means you're you're marked, you're a, a special child, and uh, they attribute all kinds of things to it, including second sight and empathic abilities and things like that. So as having that distinction, I was her favorite, so I was the one that got centered out for all these tales and stuff. Uh, my mom had nine brothers, it was just uh, the nine boys and her, so 10 kids. And uh, out of all the, the cousins I had, I was the only one that uh, was born with the, the call over my face. So there, in Granny's eyes, I was something special. And it's <laughs> interesting. sometimes I wish I wasn't because, like I said, she used to scare me when I was little. <laughs> um, she looked like a witch. She a little old, withered-looking woman, probably didn't weigh 89 pounds, kind of hunchback. And um, she would always get me alone. She had to lived in a big old Victorian farmhouse at that point and uh, she had a it once been a dining room and she turned it into a sewing room and uh, when she wasn't sewing in there there wasn't much light it was kind of dark and she would always get me in there and, and have me sit down and then she would tell me stories or tales or uh, superstitions and make sure that I knew 
uh, what to do and what not to do, especially as far as uh, having good luck or getting bad luck off of you. That was an, another big thing she was good at was that you could remove uh, bad luck or spells or anything that attached itself to you if you knew what you were doing. And uh, she would buy my silence so I wouldn't uh, tell my normal cousins all these things that she would share with me. Give me like a Hershey bar or sometimes a crisp new one dollar bill and you know, when you're a kid, six, seven, eight years old, this was back, would have been in the 60s. You know, dollar, that was a lot of money. I could do a lot with a dollar. Oh, yeah. So when are you going to write a book about uh, Appalach- Appalachian lore and, and, and all the things your grandmother taught you about? Yeah, that I've got, that's, yeah, that's one that's that's been in the works. I just I had these others pop up first. I'm under contract for uh, at least two more in the National Park uh, Mysteries and Disappearances series. And then uh, I've, I've got one of uh, Granny stories. I don't really have a title for it yet, but that's it's going to cover that kind of stuff. Uh, granny lore of Appalachia or whatever you want to call it. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to talk about strange things in the woods real quick. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite stories, that's kind of a collection of stories that you've picked up through the years. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I was a late in life, unexpected baby. Uh, my only sibling and my older brother was 17 years older than I am so my parents thought they were done raising kids and then I came along uh, my dad used to kid me and say you know you were supposed to be a 63 Corvette <laughs> they, had, they had planned to buy a sports car and uh, drive around the country like on the TV show Route 66 after they got my brother out of the house and then surprise here I am so um, all their friends were their age and in fact uh my parents were as old as a lot of my friends' grandparents or, or close to it. So a lot of times when we go to visit somewhere, there wouldn't be any kids, anybody for my age to play with. So I'd sit and uh, have to politely listen to the adults talk and stuff. But whenever there was a lull or whenever I could find a good spot to interject, I would ask them, do you know any stories? Do you know any ghost stories? You know, what is there around here that's haunted? And you know, sometimes they would just laugh and kind of play it off. And then other times, I would get some good stories, and when they saw you're actually interested in it and weren't just going to ridicule them or call them crazy or make fun of them or something, sometimes the stories would come a little easier then. Uh, but at first, there was a few people there that'd be almost like had to drag it out of them with a log chain, <laughs> and uh, even there's one guy there that has two or three stories that I've recounted in there. Uh, he, when he told me those, his wife was kind of in shock. She's like, you never even told me this. And he's like, well, I didn't know what he would think. But uh, just just picked him up that way. And uh, I, that's something that just stuck with me. I like hearing stories and then just re- remembered them, wrote them down, committed them to memory. And uh, had an epiphany at uh, my grandmother's funeral, the same grandmother I was talking about there. Thought about all the stories she had told me and all the other stories I'd heard. Things. I was like 13 at the time. And I thought, you know, everything that she ever said or did, it's it dies right there with her unless I do something to uh, keep it going on. And I just sort of assumed that mantle that one day I was going to sit down and write all these into a book, even if it was just for my own uh, use or to pass on to my kids or family members. Because, I, again, I was the only one that really paid attention to these stories and things. I a lot of the stuff in there, like I said, that even I've had people reach out to me and say, you know, the, that uh, guy in your book that told this story, that was my father. You know, thank you for, well, for that's uh, cool. le- letting his memory continue on because, you know, technically, since they're ebooks and the internet's forever, they're in paperback too. But those ebooks, those those will never go away. So, right. That was just a good way to, to collect the stories. And then when I sat down and started writing them out, it just, there was actually, it, began as two volumes i had strange things in the woods and more strange things in the woods and then when i went with my latest publisher in april of last year they wanted to combine both those into one bigger volume so that that's it's just strange things in the woods now well it's it's a great book I, i'll tell you I, I really enjoy it and i i just i like that the stories aren't aren't too overtaking you know they're they're they they get to the point and uh, with, with with enough detail to get the point across. And I, yeah. I enjoy that t- style of writing. And, and that was kind of the whole idea was that I didn't want to go out and investigate. I'm not 
an investigator, although I have done some paranormal investigation in the past. I did that back in the 80s before it was the thing to do, and everybody and their brother had a team. But uh, I'm, I'm more of a, just a, a storyteller and a, a legend tripper. I like to go to these places, not to investigate it, but just to experience, just to kind of soak in that ambiance, you know, knowing like this is where that happened. And uh, it's the smaller one-off cases, like the ones in my book, that fascinate me the most. You know, you have things that are seen regularly or that seem to happen over and over, um, whether it's a haunting or some type of cryptid or things like that. But a lot of these that just happened one time to maybe one or two people and then never happened again. So there was something special there, some sort of circumstance going on that allowed this to happen. And, and like my granny said, sometimes things happen just for one person's benefit. Yeah. My my favorite story in that book is Footprints in the Snow. I, I really yeah. I really like that that story. What what what's one of your favorite stories from that book? Uh, I, I love that one a lot. And that's just a such a creepy one. You know, where where did they come from? Where did they go? It looked like they had just gone up. Uh, one of my favorites is the flying organ. Oh yeah. And that that was actually uh, two of my relatives that experienced that when they were just young boys back in the 30s. And uh hot day they worked on the farm they lived over in uh, middle tennessee on the, the cumberland plateau and uh they were had finished their farm chores and had gone down to the creek to, to cool off and they heard what sounded like an organ coming up the creek you know that little hollow there where they were um correctly overhead the sky was clear they said there wasn't any clouds or anything there and both of them independently told me the same story and uh, sound like an old-fashioned, like a, a church organ or a pump organ. And they recognized that it was a tune, that it was playing music, but they didn't couldn't pick out what the tune was. They didn't recognize the tune. It continued right over their heads and then kind of up over the, the hill where they were, over into the next holler, as they called it, a hollow. In Appalachia, it's a holler. And uh, out of earshot. And again, this was... they. That farm over there was uh, about 900 or so acres, and it backed up to the, the Big South Fork uh, River, and uh, that area is a wildlife recreation area now. So there wasn't any church around there for miles. Uh, wasn't anything that they could have confused for an organ. They said it was obviously an organ. And uh, I mean, even flight was somewhat in its infancy. This would have been around 1930, 1931. And I can't imagine anybody going to all the trouble to put a pipe organ in an airplane and, and fly around playing yeah. it. But <laughs> then again, they would have seen or heard the plane. All they heard was the organ. Wow. So, you know, what What on earth was that? You know, that's just one of those things. There is no feasible scientific explanation. It's just something strange that happened. When I, was when in the I woods, read, so there you go. When I read that, I, I was thinking... Uh, it sounds like the fae or a fairy or, or something like that had something to do with that one. I, I don't know. That's just what my mind went to. Yeah. And uh, there's there's some other stories like that in there that I think are later on, I found out that are kind of related to the fae. There's one where, where there's two girls there picking blackberries. And uh, if you notice, a lot of missing person cases, a lot of weird things in the woods will happen around either a blackberry patch or people have gone missing picking berries and stuff in this instance they were picking berries on a hillside and uh, there was a disused or abandoned railroad bed down below them and it said that uh, one girl dropped her bucket and was silent and the other girl what's what's going on what what is it and then when she looked at what the other girl was looking at it was an old uh pine coffin coming up the, the railroad bed it wasn't on a car or anything but it was just floating a foot or two above the, the rail bed there and I, I don't even think it had rails on it at that point I think they'd already stripped the rails out and it was just cross ties and they washed it passed them up and then went around the, the corner the curve in the, the railroad and disappeared of course they took off they didn't stick around and uh, their only conjecture on that was uh, a short time later an old lady who lived in the direction that they saw the coffin like where it went around the, the curve and out of sight there was a lady that lived up that way but that had passed away shortly wow. thereafter so they think maybe it's that's another thing that you run across a lot in Appalachia people believe in omens and portents and warnings particularly uh, a death in the family or a death in general 
there'll be some kind of manifestation of something before it happens. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, you got a lot of fascinating stories in that book. And although my my favorite so far, my favorite book has been My Strange World, I absolutely love that book, man. It's a great, mm-hmm. great book. Yeah, now that one, that's my personal encounter. It's part of them. I've, I've probably got enough to fill another book. And the way that came about after uh, Strange Things in the Woods and More Strange Things in the Woods came out, I'd uh, get asked to be on shows like this one or maybe ones where the audience could call in or something like that. And invariably, either the host or a caller would say, you know, well, these are great stories. Have you ever had anything happen to you? Have you ever experienced anything? So I'd, you know, tell one or two, or I had several that I like to, to fall back on. And then it occurred to me one day, you know, I've probably got enough to fill a book here. And then once I set about writing them, I found out I, I did made a nice little book. And so there's probably more I don't know that I've got enough for a second volume. I might now because I've experienced something since that book was written. But uh, yeah, those are all personal encounters. My favorite in that book, I know there's there's a couple creepy ones that, that I, I want you to talk about, but my favorite story in that book is Marshall Says Goodbye. I yeah. loved that story, man. That was a great story. That's just, again, I think about him often. I'm still friends with his mom on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, was, I was uh, older than he was. He was, I think, 16 at the time, and I was probably 20. And uh, I liked to skateboard, and I worked with his mom at a, a grocery store. And uh, they, they're just her and her boy. She was a single mom. She just moved into the area. And I was mentioning something one day about skating. She said, oh, my, my son likes to skate. And uh, Marshall had been kind of a, a problem child. He was in and out of trouble in school and things. And, Basically, what it was, he was intelligent and got bored really easy. But uh, one day she asked me at work, she said, would you take my boys skateboarding with me? She said, I'll, I'll pay you. And I'm like, no, you don't have to do that. I'd be happy to you know, take them and show them some local spots that I knew about, things, some drainage ditches and things like that, where I like to skate. So started out that way. And uh, Marshall and I just clicked. He was like the little brother that I never had. And uh, we got into a lot of adventures together. And then... Uh, Somewhere between here and there, I'd, I'd gotten uh, into a relationship with this uh, girl who would later be my daughter's mother. And uh, I'd moved in with her into an apartment and, and didn't get to see him that much anymore. Had a kind of different circle that I uh, was involved in at that time. And uh, I hadn't seen him for a few weeks. And uh, I remember one Saturday morning, uh, I woke up, and uh, at the time, we didn't have uh, an actual bed. We just had a mattress on the floor in this apartment. And I woke up with, I was kind of hanging, my head was hanging off the mattress, and shoved right up in my face were a pair of L.A. gear shoes, uh, tennis shoes. With uh, I was kind of cheeky and had uh, different colored laces in them and things like that, but I hadn't worn them in a long time. But it was shoes that I wore skateboarding. And they're pushed right up the edge of the mattress, and literally my face is right in them. I kind of sat up, and, and I, I rough and woke up, and I said, what are you trying to do, kill me? I said, why, why would you put my shoes in my face? And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And inside the shoes, there was an unopened pack of cigarettes. And uh, well, where would these even come from? Because it was a brand that I used to smoke, but hadn't smoked in a while. And while I'm sitting there trying to puzzle all this out, the phone rings, and uh it was in the living room. My girlfriend went to answer it. And then I heard her like shriek and, and start sobbing and stuff. And uh, she called me in there, handed me the phone. And it was Marshall's mom calling to let me know that he'd been killed the night before in a, an accident. He'd gone, he'd snuck out and went skating uh, sometime around it was between midnight and 2 a.m. He was skating on the shoulder of the road and teenage girl driving her dad's BMW took a curve a little too fast and got over on the shoulder and uh, killed him instantly he went through the windshield of the car and it was weird because that night my uh, girlfriend and I had been out driving around and we she remarked that this, this, this night is so weird she said it just seems so dark out here tonight it's creepy but we didn't think anything like that about it but yeah indeed Marshall had had passed away and uh, the thing about the cigarettes his mom was from Southern California, kind of a, she called herself a, a SoCal bliss ninny. She was just kind of a 
older hippie type, and she was very lenient with her, her children, especially Marshall being 16 years old. Uh, she, she smoked, and she would allow him to smoke with the caveat being he had to have his own money for cigarettes, whether he did chores or, you know, <laughs> he used to hit me up for a cigarette and things like that. And again, you know, it was a different time back then. Right. This was early 80s. And uh, though it sounds bad giving cigarettes to a teenager, but I wasn't much more than a teenager myself. But he would always bump smokes from me if he didn't have one in the, the pack that was in that shoe. One of the shoes was the kind that I used to smoke when he had bumped cigarettes. I mean, I'd recently switched to a different brand. And I, I honestly think that that was, and he was real cheeky like that. Putting my shoes in my face while I was asleep, that was totally something he would have done and then laughed about. And uh, I didn't say anything to his mom about it for years. She seemed to handle things pretty well. But uh, again, it was, it was years before I told her about that. And she said, yeah, I, I believe that was him. And that sound, you're right, that sounds exactly like something he would have done. And uh, I talked to her, it's been a few months ago, and she claims that he still comes around to visit where she lives now. And that's how she knows he's there. She smells cigarette smoke. And she'll say, Marshall, you can't smoke in here. You got to take it outside. Wow, that is awesome. <laughs> I just have one question for you, though, Steve. Yeah. I mean, L.A. Gears, you didn't even go with the British Knights? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'd gotten them cheap. I did have a pair of uh, Vision skate shoes, but uh, the, they wore out or something, I think, and I just, I'd had the L.A. Gears, and I decided to make skate shoes out of those because it just, they'd really get uh, torn up. So, yeah, it wasn't, they weren't that nice, but, again, I just used them for skating. That's awesome. That's a great story. So, you had a crazy thing come at you in a ditch out by your house. Yeah, that's probably one of the one of the top three most frightened encounters I've ever had, or the times that I've been most frightened. Um, and that happened twice. First time I was about eight years old, and uh, I was saying earlier we lived out in the country in a semi-rural area between Oak Ridge and Knoxville, Tennessee, at 26 acres, and only about oh, four or five of that was cleared off, and the rest of it was in just as we'd gotten it, just in heavy woods and things. And um, I would just, I would get out and walk around in the woods and, and mess around, and uh, some of our land also bordered uh, TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. They had uh, like a right-of-way to the lake and uh, you could be on TVA property and not really trespassing you could could build on it or do things like that but you could you know walk on it and not get in any trouble or anything so between our property and the TVA property had a lot of woods to uh, wander around in and just do my thing well on this particular day I was up to the the east of our property and there was an old uh, ditch line that went through there I found out much later on that that ditch had been the original dirt road through the area dating back as far as revolutionary times and uh, I'd, I'd walked up and just kind of peered down in the, the crest of the ditch and on the crest and peered down into it the only thing up there uh, my brother when he lived at home he had hunting dogs in uh, the enclosure where he had kept his dogs years before was still there but it was basically rotting into the ground and uh I'm up there messing around. I looked down in the ditch and just didn't really see anything interesting. It was maybe 10, 12 feet. I mean, you could you could jump down in there, probably would have at least twisted your ankle or something. So I just, I turned around to walk away and I hear something in the leaves. I mean, it's making a lot of racket. And I turn around and look behind me and where I had just stood looking down in the ditch, something comes up out of the ditch. And whatever it is, it's disturbing the leaves. I mean, the leaves are flying up two or three feet or more in the air. I could see tree branches and things well above my head uh, getting pushed and shoved out of the way, but there's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing there, but I can see in the leaves you know, the direction that it's coming in from the tree limbs, and it's coming right toward me. Well, being eight years old, I, <laughs> I didn't waste any time <clears throat> getting out there. In fact, I ran down the hill. I was probably about a quarter mile from home, and uh, I ran down the hill. I was making such a racket, crying and screaming, that my mom had heard me from inside the house and came out on the back porch 
see what all the ruckus was. Uh, I ran past her and I think initially I went in the house and hid under the bed and then she coaxed me out to try and figure out what happened and what went on. Well, my dad got home from work and my brother, who uh, didn't live with us anymore, but he would stop by occasionally on his home, on his way home from work. He got there about the same time my dad did and my mom was telling him all this, whatever had happened to me. And you know, they were asking me all these questions. Well, was it a dog? Was it a bear? Was it a deer? No, I knew all those things. I knew what they looked like. I couldn't see what this was, but I knew it was big just from the way it was kicking up the leaves and, and mocking the trees around. So uh, they wanted to go out there and look, and I went with them, but I wouldn't go all the way up to the, the lip of the ditch. And indeed, they saw where the, the leaves were uh, messed with, and the, I think they were showing broken tree branches and things. And they concluded that there was something there, but again, they were thinking, you know, it was a bear, it was something. But, you know, no, there was nothing there. I couldn't see it. Well, just kind of let that die down, and I didn't venture up there anymore. A couple of times, uh, the, the neighbor boy, the same one I mentioned earlier, when he'd come over to play, I would send him up there. I'd be like, uh, you go up there by the, the ditch, and I'm going to wait down here behind this tree and see what happens. He didn't really know what had gone on. I didn't tell him that something had chased me. But uh, that that didn't work. It didn't work using him as bait. <laughs> Nothing came out of the ditch. And then flash forward um, like 15 at the time we were getting ready to move from there we'd sold that property actually subdivided it and split it into I think, four parcels and had bought a new home uh, farther up in near the Carnes area where I was going to go to high school and uh, right before we moved I was just kind of out walking around in the woods revisiting some of my old childhood haunts uh, places that I liked there in the woods knowing that I'd probably never see him again, at least not under the same circumstances when it was, you know, on our property. And uh, I walked back up there by the ditch, and I and I just kind of stood there, and I'm looking around. I'm remembering back, you know, uh, seven years ago. I wonder what scared me, you know, when I was a kid. And, you know, at this point, 15, I'm, I'm not afraid of much and know my way around a lot more in the woods. And uh, I walked and looked down in the ditch, just kind of uh, kind of chuckled, you know, turned around to walk away and hear this familiar noise something in the leaves sure enough I turned around whatever it was same exact thing came back up out of the ditch the leaves are flying everywhere the tree limbs are uh, moving I didn't run screaming and crying that time but I didn't waste any time getting out of there I uh, <laughs> I think I did run <clears throat> but just again you know how do you how do you confront something like that that you can't see? I wasn't going to stand there and see what happened when it got up to me. If it was going to catch me. It was going to have to, right. to run me down first. But uh, I don't know exactly when it quit chasing me, but not not too far from, from where it happened. Uh, 20, 30 feet, I guess. I didn't look back for a while. Well, it's all right to be crazy, but to be <laughs> stupid is a different thing, right? Yeah. So... Again, you know, no idea what it was, and I don't even think I said anything to anybody that time because it was the same circumstances, and I didn't want to go through the whole, it wasn't a bear, it wasn't a deer, it wasn't anything because I couldn't see it. Now, and then we moved away, and then I just kind of forgot about it. Well, then flash forward another oh, five or six years or so, I'm working at a, a fast food place over in the Cedar Bluff area of Knoxville. And uh, somebody that I only knew from work um, invited me to a party after work that was uh, at a nearby apartment complex. I'm just, I'm not a big uh, party animal. I'm more of a wallflower and stuff. But I decided, yeah, I'll go. Might be fun. And uh, so we went, and it was uh, a bunch of people our age. Uh, that I was 20, 21 at the time. And the only person I knew there was the person that I worked with. And I didn't really know him that well, just knew him from work. Well, at, at some point during the evening, uh, some of the girls in attendance had uh, found a Ouija board under the host couch, and they got that out. Like, oh, we're, we're going to play with this. Let's let's see what this what we can do with this. So they set it up. There's like three or four of them doing it, and they were taking turns going around the room and having people ask questions. So when they got to me, I thought, I don't, I've got a good one for you. And this is all I said. What scared me when I was a kid? 
I didn't give any information. I'd never seen any of these people before other than the guy that I worked with, and I hadn't told him the story. Well, they sit there, the planchette starts moving, and it spells out W-A-T-E-R-S-P-R-I-T-E, water sprite. They look at me, and I just shrug my shoulders, and they were laughing. They said, well, maybe it was something that was thirsty and wanted a drink. It wanted a water <laughs> or a, a bottle of Sprite. And I just, nah, I don't know. Didn't, didn't give them any more information. But then the next day, I went to the library in Oak Ridge. I went to the reference desk and I asked the reference I mean, I said, what can you tell me about a water Sprite? So she said, I'll, I'll see what I can come up with for you. And uh, I went and sat at the table. Sure enough, a few minutes later, she brings over a stack of books. And it's one of the fae. It's uh, there's they're like elementals. Uh, there's uh, naiads and dryads. Uh, a naiad is a protector of the water, and uh, also known as a water sprite. And then the, the dryad, it's similar. It's a protector of the woods. Well, in this particular area where we lived, there were no fewer than seven natural springs that flowed out of the hillsides into one bigger creek that flowed down into the lake. Wow. So what better place for a water sprite or a naiad or a water spirit than someplace with seven natural streams on, you know, seven being a, a, a weird number anyway. Yep. And uh, so according to the Ouija board, that's what chased me out of the area. Again, I don't know why it chased me, why it didn't chase anybody else. If there was something there that it didn't want me to bother with or just didn't like my looks or whatever, but... That's, Could go back to what your grandma told you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe you, maybe you were, maybe you, if you would have stuck around, you would have seen something that you didn't, uh, weren't supposed to see or something. Yeah, but in my mind, I already had. I knew that whatever it was, I couldn't see it, and it was big, and it was headed straight for me, and I didn't want to. It appeared big anyway. I mean, if it was a uh, smaller uh, one of the fay, it, it sure knew how to kick up the leaves and disturb the the tree limbs and stuff, and. You know, again, that's just that's not something you tell a lot of people because it, it, it makes me sound crazy. But I know what I saw, I know what I saw twice, and then to get a weird answer from a Ouija board like that from people that had never heard the story, didn't know anything about it, it all kind of just coalesced together. Wow. Yeah, that's a crazy story. That's a good one. So I want to give one more story out of that book. Now, you and your buddy next door, sounds like you guys had some really good adventures and yeah. One of those was uh, the Swanson, the Beast of Swanson Lane, right? Yeah. Now, that was a different friend. That was He didn't live oh, okay. next door. It was a few miles drive over to his house, but it was uh, he and I had known each other since second grade. And uh, they lived, they were more isolated than we were uh, in the same area. They were probably, oh, I'd say five to ten miles from, from where I lived was where they lived. They had bought part of an old much older farm that had been cut up into pieces and i think they had probably 100 acres or so there and their driveway was like a mile long it was a, a gravel driveway and it's it's a paved road now and it's actually called swanson lane that was the, the family name but uh, we were in um it's probably I guess we were around 10 or 12 when this happened so like fourth fourth grade fifth grade something like that we take turns visiting each other's houses uh, sometimes even on the weekend, you know, like spending the night with each other and things like that. Well, I'd gone over to his house one day. It was in the summertime. And uh, we had walked about halfway down the driveway. There was an old uh, shell pit there. And uh, we were looking through these uh, shell formations. And uh, I think we had, we had sticks. We might have had a hammer or something. So we were busting up with those pieces of shale looking for fossils. But occasionally, you could find stuff in the shale. And uh, up on, it was where the pit was dug into a hill. Up on the top of that hill, there was a little tumble down shack there. Like I said, this had been a working farm probably about 50 or 60 years before then. So it would be like close to 100 years now. And um, this, I mean, it looked like it was literally going to fall in on itself. We didn't even go in there or around it. We were happily laying in the, the shale pit. But uh, I think my friend looked up first and just kind of got a weird look on his face. And I looked up to see what he was looking at. And in the the side of that little shack, there was a, a window-like thing that had been cut into it. And there was something that looked, I can only describe it as a horse's skull. 
but it had eyes, and instead of being on the side of its head like a horse, they were on the front of its head, and they were huge, like the size of tennis balls. And also, horses have these big, flat teeth for uh, chewing stuff, kind of like a cow. Well, this thing had very sharp, pointed teeth and a mouthful of them. And I don't know if it was grinning at us or if it was, you know, showing its teeth. I mean, you couldn't, didn't have a lip to curl, but anyway, it looked hideous. And um, it had some kind of, uh, almost like a hood or a cloak or something on it that had a, an X uh, painted on the top. And I, I don't really remember, but I believe there may have been antlers or something on the top of its head that I couldn't see. I know that sounds weird for a horse or a deer to, to look like that, but we didn't, didn't stick around. We took off. It, it made a noise. It, it made some kind of huffing or growling noise. That's what had made my friend look up there in the first place. Well, again, we ran. We ran up back up the driveway a half mile or so. And kind of the same circumstances as before, his mom heard us coming and uh, came out there to see what was going on. We were just, you know, beside ourselves with fear and uh, kept on babbling and uh, excited and talking over one another. She was trying to get us calmed down. And finally, his dad comes out of the house and, what is going on out here? And then again, we're blabbling our story at him. And he's like, no, just you guys be quiet. I'm going to go put an end to this. He goes back in, gets a shotgun, double barrel shotgun, goes down the driveway. And we're sitting out there at this point. We're under an apple tree there drinking Kool-Aid. His mom gave us to try to calm us down. <laughs> and we keep listening, you know, we're sure there's going to be screams or shots or, or something. But uh, within probably, I mean, it seemed like a long time, but probably 15 or 20 minutes, he comes, he's walking back up the hill, he's got the, the shotgun slung over his shoulder. But he had just a very weird look on his face, kind of a confusion or a really stern, puzzled look or something. And we're like, well, did you see it? Did you kill it? You know, what happened? What happened? And he's like, he wouldn't even talk about it. He said, I want you boys to promise me you won't ever go back down there again to that shell pit or anywhere around that old shack. That's kind of confirmation for you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And we had no trouble agreeing to that. And I haven't been back <laughs> to this day. And I'm telling like my friend has <laughs> either. Does it, said it just scared the crap out of us. And um, a couple of weeks later at school, school had started back. And my friend uh, told me, he said, you remember that? You know, the thing in the shed down there. Yeah. He said, well, my dad pulled that shed down into the shell pit with the tractor and burned it. So I don't know what he saw down there, but, and this has just come to my realization in later years, uh, his dad was full Cherokee. And I think it was some kind of skinwalker or maybe a Wendigo type something, something that was, that he knew what it was and knew that it wasn't good. And that's one of the things that the elders of the Cherokee tribe will tell you that there are things you don't talk about. Because uh, like a tulpa or whatever, you can, you give it energy just by talking about it or thinking about it, and you can even draw it to you. So in just recent years, I've decided that it was something that he knew what it was. It might have been sent for him or after him or something like that. And uh, that's why he wouldn't, wouldn't talk about it or comment on it. But... Uh, we sat down independently of one another and drew what we saw and the drawings matched and again that's that's probably the, the second most scared I've ever been was whatever that was and uh, the, the place is still there like I said it's a paved road now it's called Swanson Lane and the, the family still lives up there but I, I haven't talked to uh, any of them probably 20-25 years his dad just recently passed away it was like he was in his 90s or something. So whatever it was, it, it didn't get him. <laughs> awesome. Well, you, you know, do you have any Cherokee in you? I, I do. Uh, on my dad's side, his grandmother was full Cherokee, so his mother would have, he was quarter and I'm an eighth. So not a lot, but, but just enough. <laughs> I've always wondered uh, if bloodlines matter as well, if they're another piece of the cog, you know. I, I think it does, and you combine the Cherokee and, this, and their lore, and then my, my granny and the, the Appalachian lore and the, the the witchery and all that. And I think it just makes for a perfect storm for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, hey, let's talk about some national park mysteries and disappearances because this is something that really, really 
is interesting as hell. I mean, it, it is, it, it's a lot of fun and it's mysterious. And, uh, I have a, I have a cool story to tell, tell you too. Okay. So Dennis Martin, the Dennis Martin case kind of, am I right? It kind of got you really interested in this. And, yeah. uh, I'm not sure if my, my audience knows about that case, but if you could tell, tell us a little bit about that case to start it all off. Okay. That'd be great. Um, yeah, that happened on uh, Father's Day, uh, June the 15th of 1969. Uh, Dennis was from Knoxville, same time, same town that I was from, and we were about the same age. I think Dennis was not quite a year older than me, or I think I was uh, five going on six, and he was six going on seven, something like that. We were, we were close in age, and I lived within an hour, hour and a half of the Great Smoky Mountains where he disappeared from. And... Uh, it was one of those things. It was the first time that I ever got my childlike mind around the fact that, you know, kids can go missing. Something bad can happen to kids and they never come back. And uh, he and his father and his brother and his grandfather had gone up to the Cades Cove area there in the Smokies, which that's kind of a, a strange area anyway. Uh, that's probably a t- topic for another show, but there's all kinds of weird stuff in Cades Cove. And then they'd hiked farther up into the park of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park into an area known as Spence Field. And uh, they met another family there that had some, some boys also who were also named the Martins. Now, there's all kinds of weird Ooh, synchronicities crazy. and things in this case. And the two Mr. Martins introduced themselves to one another and said, let's, you know, let's let our kids play together. And uh, Dennis and his brother and these other, other Martin kids, and there was no relation, uh, we're playing either hide and go seek, or maybe they were going to try to sneak up on the, the adults and scare them. I've heard it told both different ways. But either way, uh, Dennis's dad watched Dennis go into a, like a little uh, brushy area, a little uh, outcropping of uh, weeds and brush and stuff. Watched him go in there, presumably to hide. And then a few minutes later, the other kids are out running around, and he doesn't see Dennis anywhere. And uh, like, you know, has anybody seen Dennis? And they're like, no, last time we saw him was when we were, you know, start playing hide and seek or scare the adults or whatever they were going to do. And it was then that he realized, you know, something happened. He goes to the, the, the area of brush where Dennis walked into the bushes there, goes all around it. No Dennis goes into it. There's no Dennis. And that's when he realized, you know, Dennis is gone. Dennis is missing. And in fact, that, that was the last time he ever saw Dennis was when he saw him entering that uh, bushes. And uh, he sends his father down to the ranger station to get help, the, Dennis's grandfather. And then Dennis's dad takes off in a run down the Appalachian Trail, which goes through there. And I guess he just picked a direction, probably downhill, and uh, ran down that way for a couple of miles just to see if he could see Dennis. And um, no sign of him. But there was family called the key family in another part of the park that had asked a ranger where they might go to see some bear and uh, a ranger had directed them to an area well they're in this area looking for bear and uh, they heard what they described as the most blood curdling scream they'd ever heard and then they looked into this area where they'd heard the scream from and uh, one of the kids said hey there's a bear and the dad says no that's that's not a bear that's a person but he described it as a big, uh, like almost unkempt looking person, like a, maybe wearing animal skins or something like that. And it was carrying something over its shoulder and running up a hillside. Now, they supposedly, the FBI worked that out that they don't think Dennis could have made it from where he was last seen down to where the Key family was in the time that it transpired between the disappearance and the sighting. But uh, Mr. Martin disagreed with that. Him and uh, Ranger um, Dwight McCarter, who was famous, and sm- he wrote a book about the Smokies called Lost. Uh, he was the lead tracker on a lot of <clears throat> missing person cases, and that one in particular. They found out later on that it probably could have done it, or somebody carrying a kid could have done it. The kid might not have been able to do it on his own. But um, no, no trace was ever found in Dennis. The only thing they found one. Uh, heel print that they thought might have been his but then there were some uh, boy scouts that had been in the area too and they were wearing the same kind of little uh, 
Santa Oxford or whatever Dennis had on when he disappeared. Um, he was wearing red when he disappeared. And if you study these cases, that's a very common thing. People wearing red tend to go missing. Um, or people that go missing tend to be wearing red. Maybe that'd be a better way to say it. And yeah, that just, like I said, that stuck with me. Just kind of, I don't know, lit me up or something. And I started following the case from that that very day. You know, they talked about it that night on the news, and then the next day it was all over the news there in Knoxville. And at that time, uh, Knoxville had uh, two daily papers, had the Knoxville News Sentinel, which was the evening paper, and the Knoxville Journal, which was the morning paper. And we got both. And uh, I started clippings of uh, the of Martin disappearance and somewhere. I think my sister-in-law has them now. They were with some of my brother's stuff. Uh, I had two scrapbooks full of clippings about Dennis and just, I don't know, just never forgotten that case. And uh, again, you know, I was about five when it happened, five going on six. And in my little childlike mind, we only lived about an hour, hour and a half from the Smokies where he disappeared. And I thought, you know, I wonder if he could have wandered down this far. So I'm out riding country road out there where we live on my Schwinn Stingray looking in the bushes to see if I could find him you know so I was trying to do my part but it just it, it never happened and, and every year around the anniversary of the disappearance they usually have an interview with uh, Mr. Martin on TV and just I remember one time he said I've always thought that someday there'd be a knock at the door and I'd go to answer the door and there'd be a handsome man standing there and I'd say yes can I help you and he'd say it's me, Dad. It's Dennis. I've come home. And you talk about something that just jerks your heartstrings. Now, it's we just passed the, uh, I think it's the 52nd anniversary of it. I, I can't do math in my head. But it happened in 1969. This is 2021. So, uh, And his dad passed away, I think about four or five years ago on Halloween, no less, with, with never any closure or anything. He was just... He's absolutely broken and haunted, man. I used to see him around Knoxville. And just, you know, what, what do you even say to somebody like that? Yeah, that's that's terrible. It's always tragic whenever, you know, a child is missing or, or passes before their parents, man. Yeah. It, it, it shouldn't be that Nothing way. Nothing worse than a, a parent having to, to bury a child. And, and that's just, you know, that's just one of the disappearances in the Smokies. That was in 69, in 1976, uh, Trini Lynn Gibson went missing. And uh, kind of an odd coincidence here, she lived in the same uh, Bearden neighborhood in Knoxville that the Martins lived in. Uh, huh. She was on a school trip to the Smokies. Uh, it was a surprise trip for the biology teacher. The kids didn't even know where they were going until they were on the bus headed there. And um, they'd gone up to Cleveland's Dome, which is the highest point in the Smokies. There's an observation deck up there. And it's, it's a pretty good little hike. I've been up there many, many times. And um, she had been to the Dome, and then they, they hiked to another area. And then on the way back, she broke away from the group. And uh, they said they saw her go around a, a turn, go around a curve in the trail. And uh, somebody said they even saw her, like, kind of stoop down and look down into the woods like she was looking at something off trail. And then she stepped into the woods and uh, into the pages of Smoky Mountain lore. That was the last time anybody ever saw her. And uh, she was, I think, 16. And uh, that one's another one that's just totally destroyed the family. The mom and dad got divorced. Um, her younger sister, Tina, was actually best friends with my niece. And uh, I talked to Tina several years ago. She passed away now. She literally drank herself to death. But she said it was just terrible that you know, it destroyed the parents' relationship. That uh, her and her older brother, her older brother was in the military, so he wasn't around much. But she said it just made my home life absolute hell. That you know the parents would get mad at me. I think her dad even said to her one time that you should have been the one that disappeared. So, you know that'd be tough to hear wow. yeah. as a kid. But again, you can understand their frustration. And it's kind of the same thing. No trace of her. Uh, the only thing they found was in that area where she had stepped off the trail. They found, um, I think, a half of a, a beer in a can and some cigarette butts. Now, I've often wondered if they saved that, if they might be able to pull DNA from that. Now, this was in 76, so there, there wasn't any such thing as DNA. Yeah. But uh, several theories about that, that she uh, ran away with a, a boyfriend. And, uh, Tina, her sister, even said that, you know, part of me likes to think that 
that Trini did run away with some boy and then she's somewhere maybe in sunny Southern California living her life away because their parents were kind of restrictive and rough. And she said, you know, but in my heart of hearts, I don't think she was left the park alive. Wow. So let's talk about some of the criteria. Like when you go to research a case to put it in one of your books, what, what are the criteria? Because I know there's a lot of strange things that, that involve these cases. Like, like, give me a little bit of what the criteria would be. Yeah. Well, mainly it's just the ones that, that seem to go missing without leaving anything behind. Uh, those are the most fascinating cases to me where uh, they, they disappear and there, there's no clue as to what happened to them. It's like they simply just vanished. And um, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll find, you know, parts of their belongings or things like that. But uh, a lot of people think that it, it may be suicides or um, animal predators or things like that. But anything like that, there's going to be some sign left behind. There's going to be blood evidence. There's going to be signs of disturbance. Uh, even an apex predator, you know, a panther, a big cat, or a bear, or anything like that, they're not going to eat the, the clothing and stuff like that. And then most of these cases, they'll they'll study uh, bear scat in the area when they're looking to see if, if somebody's been eaten. But um, there's just a lot of strange things that's happened. Like I said, a lot of times people will be uh, will go missing either while have they've been picking berries or near an area where berries are grow. Or um, a lot of times, uh, persons that have gone missing will be wearing red. Uh, it's usually the somebody that's uh, separated from a group. Um, there's all kinds of just weird little coincidences like that. Um, tend to be uh, the missing that are never found tend to be of Germanic descent, and they tend to be on both ends of the intelligence scale. Uh, people on the autism spectrum. And then super intelligent people like PhDs and stuff, they both tend to go missing about the same rate. And uh, also people that uh, are very healthy and in good shape tend to go missing. So there's there's some overlap there. There's some where it's this one and not this. But there are several different criteria in there that, that kind of make for it. And... Um, and there are, you know, some that could be suicides or uh, taken by human predators and things like that. But whatever it is, if it is a person or an animal or something doing it, it's doing it with 100% efficiency. And I don't think there's ever been a zoom conjecture that it might be a group of serial killers that, uh, you know, like a band of uh, satanic cultists or whatever that travel around and take people out of the woods and off the trails and stuff. But again... They do it with 100% efficiency if they do because there's no clue, no trace left. And uh, a lot of people claim that it's people that go into the woods to die on purpose by their own hand. But even then, some of these are just literally people just walked off into the woods and then they're gone. I don't think it would be possible to, to find a place that you could just hop off the trail and find a place where you could die and not be found right. eventually. And, uh, and there's even stranger cases of like where people have been found it'll often be in an area that's been thoroughly searched and uh, say a person's been missing for a couple of months the body will be found and the autopsy will show that they've only been dead for a few days or maybe a week or two so where were they the rest of the time when they were still alive yeah and uh, sometimes the clothing is found under strange circumstances uh, pants neatly folded but hung in a tree or boots side by side that's another thing a lot of missing people they will find the boots and why if you're in the woods why would you take your boots off that makes absolutely no sense if you're lost in the woods yeah it doesn't make any sense at all i mean there have been people that have been found with um with their clothes on backwards even are uh, is it yeah and just strange things like that um, another one read about where the guy they found the body uh, he'd taken his boots off and had walked several miles in uh, several feet of snow and was within sight of a cabin and, and a roadway but he had stayed in the woods now that, that doesn't make any sense at all there's a lot of strange circumstances in there and um, another one of boulder fields tend to play sometimes into these disappearances 
they'll find people in boulder fields that look like they've uh, fell or jumped from a considerable height to land on these boulders, yet there's no considerable height for them to have jumped from. There's nothing around there that would account for that. But something that I find interesting about that, again, this is a real stretch, but uh, the Algonquin tribe uh, up in the New England area, there's a, a place up there called the Bennington Triangle where people tend to go missing. There's a particular mountain where people tend to go missing. And um, the Algonquins have a story about rocks that uh, are alive and they have the ability to open up and swallow people and then spit them back out. So if you think about that, if a rock had the ability to open up and then close, crush you to death, and then spit you back out on top of the rocks, that's probably, it would look very similar to if you'd fallen from a great height. So it make, makes you wonder about some of these Native American legends and, and what they know and, and what's really out there that, that we may not know of and may not understand. And again, kind of get to the area of the Fae and you know, elves and trolls and things like that. But in a lot of societies, that they put a lot of stock and a lot of faith in that. I know in, uh, I think it's Norway, uh, they'll build a roadway around an outcropping of rocks rather than blow it yeah. up because they don't want to disturb the trolls in there. That's bad luck. And uh, if you look at some of the uh, the Celtic uh, fairy lore from back in the, the 1800s and beyond that, going farther back, it was almost like a religion that they had over there regarding the Fae and what you do and don't do and how you don't want to anger them in this. So, uh, on my channel, Missing Persons and Mysteries on YouTube, we've started delving into that theory a little bit uh, with a series called The Missing and the Fae. And I'm just getting ready to record part four. But it's it's fascinating. And what's even more so, I think, is the people that, that are missing and come back that are found under strange circumstances, and yet they either won't talk about what happened to them or they don't remember. They just simply don't remember where they were at or what they were doing. And if you look into the, the Fae theory on that, it's people that uh, have been bewitched or mesmerized with the Fae, kind of the old Rip Van Winkle thing where he saw the, the little man playing ten pins in the woods and they offered him a drink from their jug and then he wakes up you know, 20 years later or whatever it yeah. is with a long beard and uh, nobody knows who he is. That's crazy, man. Now, you had a you had a friend that went missing and uh, was found, right? I uh, had a couple of them. Uh, Bill Melder, the uh, other uh, part of the Missing Person Mysteries channel, the creative partner, he uh, got lost in uh, Joshua Tree out in California and was lost for several days. And he had some really strange encounters, saw some, some kind of strange beings. He said they almost looked like what people describe as the alien greys. And he said they would get close to him, but when he would acknowledge them or whatever, they would just kind of scatter away. And uh, I think he was, I want to say five days that he was out there in Joshua Tree. And then I've got another story in there um, about a friend of mine that was hiking in a, a, a state park and got lost and was missing for a couple of days. And that one turned out to be there's an, an entity uh, I'd never heard of it before, uh, except on a the show called Strange Familiars with Tim Renner, they talk about an entity called the Flannel Man, where people see this woodsman-like figure, lumberjack-like figure that wears a, specifically with the buffalo plaid, the red and black plaid. And uh, I didn't know it, but when I first heard that story, I called it the Phantom Woodsman. Um, that's from about 15 or 16 years ago that I heard that story. And now I believe that's a flannel man encounter. That same entity has been seen several different times by several different people in kind of the same circumstances and things. So uh, it just it makes you wonder what's really out there and, and what is all this. It's a lot of uh, Fordian type stuff, you know, with strange occurrences, anomalous things that, that defy any explanation. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. It, it, you know, California is a strange place anyway, um, out there in the mountains. It's it's really nuts. Um, they have, what are they called, the dark watchers out there too that people see all the time? Yeah. Yep, they have, have the watchers. And uh, one of the strangest places, and I've been to Joshua Tree, it is a trip. I mean, that's There's something there, some kind of energy vortex or something I've heard it, that, that uh, that's a power spot for the, the supernatural things. 
And uh, Mount Shasta in Northern California is like that too. I've been to Shasta and there's everything been seen there. Bigfoot, UFOs, uh, people in uh, robes and covered in gold walking around ascended masters. That's, I uh, can't remember the gentleman's name, but there was a guy that claimed to have met the ascended master version of Count St. Germain on the slopes there back in the, in the 20s or 30s and founded a religion based on it, which uh, they still have a reading room there in the adjacent little town called Weed, California. Uh, also, one of the most unusual Bigfoot sightings I've ever heard of was on Mount Shasta. A lady claimed she observed a female Bigfoot sitting under a tree uh, nursing a baby Bigfoot. Now that's that's unusual. Yeah. I've never heard of, of, of that, but what a, what a great encounter. I'd love to see something like that. And um, if you've heard the story about the what's, what they call robot grandma, where the, the kid went missing, and um, they found him a few days later in an area that had already been searched, just sitting on the side of the trail. And he had this fantastic tale that when he was lost, he ran into his grandma, but he realized it wasn't his grandma, but a robot version of her. And she took him into a cave on the mountain. And he said there was all these old, dusty, like, uh, backpacks and weapons and purses and stuff that belonged to other people, all covered in cobwebs and stuff. And uh, she tried to get him to defecate on a piece of paper. Wow. And he wouldn't wouldn't do it. And then finally she's like, well, okay, you're not uh, complying. I'm just going to take you back and put you on the trail. And somebody will find you soon. And, and that's what happened. And uh, the really weird thing about that was his actual grandmother, the one that he saw the robot version of, had had an experience not too long prior to when he went missing where she was camping in on Shasta and uh, woke up one morning outside of her tent, face down on the ground with no idea what had happened, and she had a puncture wound in the back of her neck. So, wow. you know, you can fill in a lot of blanks there, like did something take DNA or something from her and make this replicant version of her that later on the kid encountered or... Steve, that's creepy as hell, man. That's a creepy <laughs> story, man. It is. It really is. My uh, brother-in-law, so he, uh, I'll, I'll give you my story. My brother-in-law, he's a, he's a, an adventurer. He's, he's hiked almost the entire Appalachian Trail. Um, and he started getting bored with that. So he went out to uh, the Sierra Nevadas and, uh, you know, did the ration thing and where he, I think he was out there for eight days, something like that by himself. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't, nobody goes with him. He does it by himself. Uh, so one night there's a spot there, I guess, that's the hardest p- p- part of the John Mural uh, trail. And uh, they say, you know, don't, don't. They told him not to hike that at night and to be very careful. So it was dark by the time he made it to that point. So he got his stuff ready, pitched his, I don't even know if he had a tent, got, got set up for the night, uh, had started a fire and was getting ready to smoke a cigar and drink a little bit of bourbon and uh he said he just poured his bourbon had his cigar lit uh, lit and he sees this light coming down out of out of the out of these trees and he's like that's really strange here comes this light and it's bobbing and bobbing and bobbing and pretty soon it comes closer to him and he realizes that it's a headlamp somebody's headlamp and uh it, the trail is right next to where his camp is and uh he, he said, here comes this woman walking with a headlamp on, and he said it was cold. She had a hoodie on, and that was it. Uh, she had her head down. She was wearing a dress and, like, uh, like Ked sneakers, like, like the canvas-type sneakers. Uh-huh. And he's like, I was sitting there thinking, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Nobody hikes with a dress on. Nobody hikes with, with those shoes on. And nobody, and she's going right towards the hardest part of the trail that you're not supposed to do at night. And she, wow. that was it. And he, so he goes, I kind of freaked out. He said, I stood up I, and I said, are you, uh, are you all right? Do you need help? You know, he said, didn't even look at him. Just kept walking. He said it again. He said, excuse me. He turned on his light and he said, do you need help? Just kept walking right through the trail. This freaked him out enough that he packed the stuff up and moved to a different <laughs> spot. So, oh man, I don't blame him. There's just there's all kinds of weird stuff like that out there, especially in the national parks, forests, and the wildlife areas and things. Um, 
I've got a story in my book there uh, called It Was a Pizza. And that was a friend of mine. He was in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. And they came across out in the middle of nowhere in the woods, a fresh pizza. He said it was almost like something had laid a trap there or something. He's like, you know, I wasn't going to eat it or anything, but it looked fresh. It wasn't molded. It hadn't been rained on. It was in the box with the lid open as a pepperoni. And, you know, this, what, what on earth, how, what circumstances would, you know, have to occur for a pizza just to be sitting out in the middle of nowhere? And he said that wasn't even the strangest thing that he'd seen. He said another time, uh, this is so funny, he said they saw a guy wearing nothing but a clown mask and tube socks, picking <laughs> his way carefully through a briar patch. <laughs> wow. But he said, that's another story for another time, and I never did get the rest of that story. But. Maybe that guy ate the pizza, and that's what would have happened. <laughs> I know what the pizza was. It's a fat guy trap. That's what that is. Somebody <laughs> yeah. was waiting for somebody well, like me to come by, because I'd have ate that damn thing. Well, you think about that. There was uh, another missing person case I heard about where a lady was missing and was trying to find her way out. She claimed that she could, like, hear people calling for her, but when she would go toward the voice, she was actually going the wrong way. And she saw things like donuts in trees, like where people had left donuts for. But but the people that were searching in earnest said, no, we, we wouldn't do anything like that. We're not going to leave donuts in trees. That's so, strange. Know, what was that? But that, that's kind of a common occurrence, though, where people will hear their name being called, and then they call back and one side can't hear the other or they can both hear each other, but they can never see or find each other. It's almost like there's a some kind of glitch or a slip, either a time slip or space or something there where it, they're both in the same place, but not at the same time, like in a different level or something. I don't even know how to describe yeah. it. But that's, I think that like there's so many theories out there based on like you know you got your your standard bigfoot aliens uh the, the cave systems even and reptilians and you know things like that but time mm-hmm. slip to me i feel like time slip is a solid one and you know maybe that that little boy ghost you saw when you were a kid was someone who got lost in the woods and they time slipped out and you know who knows and then when he fell down, he went back to where he was supposed to be, I hope. Right. Um, I had, had a lady come on my show once, and she told a story about when she was a little girl. She was uh, going down the street. Some of her neighbors had a, a Coke machine on their front porch, and it was a way for them to make a little extra money and then just, you know, get to talk to people and stuff. It was kind of a, a neighborhood hangout. Well, she was going down the street to get a Coke, and uh, she passes a man who's uh, standing in the edge of a vacant lot. And uh, she's like looking around thinking, wow, this is why we've never noticed this vacant lot before. This would be a great place to, to play ball. You know, I'm going to tell all my friends about this. And so the, the man standing there, he kind of smiled at her and says, uh, it's uh, a great day out. And apparently going to say today or isn't it or something. And before he finished, he was just gone. Oh. And uh, she was kind of, you know, what was that all about? She goes ahead and gets her drink comes back she's still puzzling over this and when she gets to where the vacant lot was she said it wasn't vacant at all that there were houses and things there and she said i knew that those houses were there i don't know you know where that vacant lot came from because i knew i'd never seen it before it's the same street that she lived on she was just a child but still she knew the way to the coke machine and back and and she thinks that's what that was that that was some kind of time slip because she saw either from the past or in the future where this area was and there was nothing there and she likes to think that the way she described it was like if you think of time it was like two pieces of silk and sometimes they they come close enough together to touch and you can kind of see what's printed on both pieces of silk and then they separate back and uh, she thinks that somewhere there was probably a man standing in a vacant lot that sees a little girl coming by and when he starts to speak to her she disappears so somewhere, you know, there's the other side of that story. So fascinating to think about. Yeah, you know, so definitely. That's that's the kind of stuff I think about when I, I'm awake at night, you know, just laying here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's 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 a really, like, you can lose yourself thinking about that, you know? Mm-hmm. And this, a lot of stuff, you know, I don't think there is a scientific explanation. I don't think there have to be. Uh, if you think about it, if you believe in uh, biblical things, 
what we consider the natural was all spoken forth out of the supernatural. So actually, the supernatural is the normal and the natural is just what we know. So I can kind of see that route, how there can be things that we can't understand and that what the laws and theories and things that we've came up with may not necessarily apply to the things the way they really are. I mean, Charles Fort said that one measures a circle beginning anywhere. That makes a lot of sense. You know, yeah. here you can start any place and kind of end up back in the same place, and it doesn't mean you, you found out anything. But in my quest, there's never been any answers really, but more questions. Right. I mean, and and that's 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 why we do this, right? Because yeah, it's it's fun, and uh, if there were answers, it wouldn't be fun anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's just I've talked about that that if they do find or capture Bigfoot that would be the worst thing ever especially for the creature they're going to put it in cages and, and charge people to see it or they're going to poke it and prod it and take blood and fluids and stuff from it that'd be terrible I hope I don't want anybody to kill one but I hope if they ever do find one it's already deceased because I would want any sentient creature to suffer what it would have to go through if they took one alive yeah you are correct about that that's exactly what would happen so unfortunately yeah but so where can everybody find you your youtube channels uh your books all that stuff steve all right my, my books are on amazon and wherever fine books are sold my publisher likes me to say that uh they're on uh, kindle version and uh, paperback and just Amazon.com, search for Steve Stockton and get Strange Things in the Woods and uh, My Strange World and then the new National Park Mysteries and Disappearances, Volume 1, The Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And then at the end of August, Volume 2 is coming out and it's going to be in California, uh, specifically centering on Joshua Tree, Mount Shasta, and Yosemite. And uh, on YouTube, my main channel is Missing Persons and Mysteries. And then I've got another personal channel where I narr- get, <clears throat> excuse me, narrate some stuff out of my books and things. And it's called 13 Past Midnight. Have a lot. That's just a fun channel. But the, but uh, Missing Persons and Mysteries, that's that's the main one. And we're just just rolling up on 100,000 subscribers, probably hit it uh, in the next couple of months or so. So I'm just, I'm ecstatic. But, oh, yeah. You know, I never thought I would be a part of anything that popular. That is awesome, man. Well, hey, Steve, I really appreciate you coming on, man, and I'd, I'd actually like to have you on again in the future. Sure. Just, just let me know. I, I love, if there's anything I love more than, than researching these stories and writing about them and talking, it's coming on and talking about them on a show like this. You know, that's, the, the, my work's already done, the stuff's out there, and now I can just relax and just, I enjoy talking about it. You know, that's that's part of the, the pleasure in it for me. Yes, sir. I'm a storyteller, raconteur, more so than an investigator. Oh, you're good at it, too. I'll tell you that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, hey, Steve, I really appreciate appreciate you coming on, man, and uh, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, that about does it for Dreamland tonight, dreamers. Thanks again for listening, and good night.